use of artificial intelligence to spread this information is perhaps the biggest challenge we face as fact checkers right now. Siempre trabajando contra las noticias falsas. They know that's a big chunk of voters that are on social media that you have to be there to reach them. But I truly do think that we're facing a Latino voting bloc um, that has immense power. En Noticias Telemundo estamos de un solo lado, el tuyo. Welcome to the Backstage con Telemundo podcast, where you will hear from all of our stars in front of and behind the camera on what it's like to work for the epicenter of the Hispanic media world and how we bring that juego and juego to all screens. Ahora sí, vámonos Backstage con Telemundo. Con más de 36 millones de votantes elegibles en Estados Unidos, el voto latino será primordial para estas elecciones presidenciales, las cuales se aproximan el 5 de noviembre. And as Decision 2024 gets closer, today we're joined by Noticias Telemundo's social media manager, Iris Castro, fact-checking journalist Ronnie Rojas, and MSNBC and Noticias Telemundo contributor Paola Ramos to talk about the Latino vote and the behind-the-scenes process to cover the race to the White House. Paola, Ronnie, Iris, bienvenidos. Welcome to the podcast. Muchas gracias. So excited to be here with you guys. Thank you. Feliz de estar aquí con ustedes. Hi, what a pleasure. Thank you for having us. And it's a pleasure to have you guys here to talk about your coverage process as we head for the polls. And, you know, one of the things that's top of mind for many of us as voters during this election season is how can we ensure that we're getting the most accurate information from the most trusted news sources? And I feel a lot of that has to do with understanding what the news gathering process is like. So with that, I want to head straight into the newsroom. Uh, Paola, Ronnie, Iris, can you talk to us about your preparation process? process as you prepare to cover for the presidential elections and what election day looks like for each of you. Pao, you want to go first? Yeah. Um, so for me, always, of course, top of mind is polls, 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 right? I think we spend so much time looking at different polls, different surveys and trying to make sense of the trends. But I really do think that there's nothing more important than your own personal gut check. And so for me, beyond the polls is ensuring that I have trusted sources on the ground, right, that can help me make sense of all the numbers that we're seeing. And then I think like the second thing that's important for me is, is really getting a good understanding of the mobilizing issues and the most polarizing issues in this election. I think right now, Those two are abortion and immigration. So really making sure that we're nuanced and, and really grounded in the way that voters are perceiving those two issues. And then finally, um, I really think a lot about how am I going to summarize all this information in three minutes in a way that's digestible for our audience. Then you ask about election day. I'm pretty sure I'm going to end up being in Arizona. I think that's a state where Joe Biden won by less than 1% in November of 2020. And so I'm really curious to see what ends up happening in a couple of weeks. I think we're all there with you, Paola. A lot to look forward to in this election cycle. Uh, Ronnie, Absolutely. what about you? Um, yeah, I mean, this, uh, these have been weeks of intense work, you know, trying to keep track of the candidates, uh, helping voters uh, better understand their candidates' stance on the issues that concern them most. Uh, we have been reporting stories about Latin communities and how some U.S. cities that are now majorly Hispanic have evolved and, and, and could end up deciding the election in November just last week. I was in Pennsylvania reporting from what is now known as the Latino Belt. You know, like these um, older industrial cities that have made an extraordinary recovery thanks in part to the arrival of new Latino residents, um, mostly migrant cities like Hazleton, Allentown. But we also have been doing a lot of fact-checking to verify the, what the candidates and their political campaigns are saying and debunking false narratives targeting Latinos that have has been our priority in recent weeks. Efectivamente, Damia, te verifica es la herramienta de verificación de información de Noticias Telemundo. Uh -huh. Lo que hacemos es desmentir información falsa y engañosa que circula en Internet, en redes sociales. También verificamos el discurso público, lo que dicen políticos y otras figuras importantes. We've done live fact-checking on the presidential and vice-presidential debates. And uh, on November 5th, election day, we'll be, we will be on alert from the early morning hours to debunk any 
misinformation spreading online, uh, aim at preventing people from voting or creating uh, distrust in the electoral process. Our priority will be to keep an eye on news circulating on social media, information sent by our readers, uh, the candidates' statements during the day, and so on. And sounds like your hands are going to be very full, Ronnie. Best of luck to <laughs> you on that yeah. night. <laughs> uh, Edis, what about you? Yes, I, I totally agree with uh, what Ronnie and Paola said, and, and I want to just continue on, on that role. And they talked about uh, trustworthy sources and polls and fact-checking were monumental for our coverage and also preparation. Like for us on social media, mm -hmm. it's number one, being ready. And that means getting the tools that you need and getting the information, but also be open to the unexpected because we know how fast things move on social and how many things can like break first there. So we have to have um, a steady hand going uh, fast, but also accurate. So for us, I think that one of the, of the main things that we do is prepare to be ready to go out with news that are accurate on a timely manner. And that is going to take preparation not only the day of the election, by months before. As Ronnie was saying, we've been working on the debates, we've been doing fact-checking of the speeches that the candidates are doing. We've been talking to the people on different states around the country. And social media is the one place in which all of this kind of converges. And we see that people are a lot more vocal, if we can say, on social when they post their things. So we try to use the Telemundo, uh, Noticias Telemundo accounts to be the source of information that you can get from social that is going to be an extension of what you can see on the news and the you know, newspaper. Con un equipo periodístico confiable, claro y objetivo. So our work is to be that balance between uh, accuracy and timely. Sounds interesting. And what does election day look like for you from the moment you wake up, Edie's, to the moment you go live on social? Oof. Uh, elections are so much fun, <laughs> actually. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work because it's an event that, you know, it's like, I always say it's like the Olympics of news because we've been preparing for this uh, for years. We had midterm election and then finally it's here. And it starts very early. Very early, sometimes How even. How early are we talking about? Ugh, I'll say that okay. by 5.30, we're up. We have Noticias del Mundo Ahora, which is live at 7. And then we have a team that covers everything. But we usually, you know, do rehearsals for what we're going to present on air. And we have commercial breaks that we take care of. And we have the plan for social. And we also have contributors like Paola. And Ronnie's doing fact-checking. So it's a lot of moving parts that have to sing together. So it starts very early. We start coming, uh, whether to the office or if we have reporters on the field, they, you know, they, they've been probably reporting there from days before. And then it all uh, continues to evolve until nighttime, which is like the big show. Muy buenas noches. Bienvenidos a la batalla por el poder. And then we are counting the votes as they come, which is... Has you experienced this <laughs> as a viewer? It's, it's very um, nerve-wracking and exciting. And we are kind of like going with what's happening at the time. And it's fantastic. I, I just want to say it's, it's great. Well, it sounds <laughs> fascinating. Sounds like a lot of work. But clearly a lot of preparation, a lot of pressure comes with this huge responsibility and commitment uh, that's on all of your shoulders. And speaking of that pressure, Paola, you're a regular contributor to our English and Spanish language newscast here at NBC Universal. And when we're talking about a highly polarized political environment like the one we're living in today, that's a tough job mm -hmm. to have. So I'm curious to know, what's your approach to your reporting style during election season? Season, and how do you yeah. manage to process the volume of information that exists out there to provide us with comprehensive analysis in your coverage? Yeah, I mean, I have to say you 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 laid it out perfectly, right? Like we, we are constantly exposed to so much myth and disinformation, to so much information. And so honestly, relying on people like Edith and Ronnie to really get those fact checks, I think has been like an integral part of our job. You know, I don't think I would be able to do my job without them, you know, and without the work and integrity that, that their role implies. And so I would start there. And then my, my approach, I think the last four years has been this. You know? I think two stories and two trends can be true at once. And always within that framework, look at the nuance. Um, I think about the Latino vote, for instance, right? It is true that Democrats are winning 
the Latino vote, but it's also true that Republicans are making inroads, right? And so always having that framing in mind and guiding the viewers and the audience through the nuances, right? What makes for those differences? What do generational differences look like? Religious differences, racial differences? Um, how does all of that sort of manifest in those differences that we're seeing. And so that's always my approach. Two things can be true at once um, and then explain the nuances that take you to those differences. Very interesting. And Paola, you're very well studied when it comes to the Latino vote specifically. You even launched a new book called Defectors. Uh, curious to know, what are some of the top insights you found on the power of the Latino vote? And has there been mm -hmm. any shift in Latino voter sentiment over recent years? Yeah, I mean, look, I think the, the basic is, I feel like we say this every single election, like the Latino vote this year will be the most important one. Um, but I truly do think that we're facing a Latino voting bloc um, that has immense power. No, there's over 36 million eligible voters, which means that at least one in 10 eligible voters across the country are Latino. El futuro de los Estados Unidos se decide voto a voto. Y el voto Latino es crucial. Um, in a place like Arizona, that means that a fourth of eligible voters are Latino. Um, then I think of the way that we've changed over the past 20, 30 years. And I think um, the audience 20, 30 years ago was vastly different from who we are now. And um, we're talking about a Latino voting bloc that is younger, that has become more Americanized, more assimilated. It is third generation Latinos that have become the fastest growing segment within us. And so what that means is that most people now are U.S. born. Most people are under the age of 50. And a lot of people are consuming content in Spanglish. No? And so that sort of speaks to a lot of the, the nuances and the complexities that I think we're, we're all talking about. Um, and then, yeah, I think there, there has been a shift. And even if we think about the issue of immigration and how that sort of comes up in our community, I think that's really telling. I think right now what the polls are showing, and Telemundo had an incredible poll on this, is that even when Latino voters are facing the issue of immigration, it is completely split in the way that we are prioritizing the issue, right? There's over 50% of folks that want to prioritize comprehensive immigration reform. And then suddenly we're also seeing increasingly that another sort of half of Latino voters wants to prioritize border security. And so that, again, that shows you um, sort of the heart of what this is all about, you know, and that is we are not a monolith. And I think finally in this election, we're understanding what that means. Right. Uh, thank you for the insight there. And clearly a lot more work to be done to understand the Latino voting bloc. Um, but if there's one thing that's certain, as you said, Paola, is that uh, as the fastest growing demo in America and even with 1.4 million Latino eligible voters every year, this is a voting bloc that matters. Some say can even mm -hmm. potentially be the swing vote to the White House. And then when you think about the fact, too, that Latinos are heavy digital consumers. In fact, there was a recent Axios poll that said that um, Latinos consume news at overwhelming amounts from digital devices, consequentially mm -hmm. prone to misinformation and disinformation, as you and Ronnie have mentioned. Um, it becomes a topic of concern and I think of service for us here at Telemundo. So I'm looking at you, Ronnie, because I know you're the guy behind this. Uh, talk to us about some of the fact checking efforts we've launched here at Telemundo and your process for verifying information as a fact checking journalist. Um, yeah, so we have Te Verifica. Te Verifica is um, Noticias Telemundo's fact-checking platform, which, by the way, I have to say, uh, it was the first Spanish uh, language uh, fact-checking project in the U.S. certified by the International Fact-Checking Network. And by this, I mean that we comply with code of principles, impartiality, transparency, willingness to correct our work when necessary, and so on. Uh, we launched this project in 2020. Yeah, we have been in this battle for uh, four years now. And I say battle because what we do is fight uh, against the misinformation and disinformation. Aquí sí que somos enemigos de las mentiras. Like we go after false narratives targeting uh, the Spanish speakers in the U.S. We fact check what politicians say to the public. We debunk lies conspiracy theories, uh, fake information spreading on social media, altered pictures, manipulated videos, and so on. You know, aquí trabajo no nos hace falta, eso sí pueden estar seguras. Ahora que comienza la campaña electoral, es muy importante lo que nos dicen los políticos. Vamos a estar para ustedes verificando qué de eso es verdadero, es engañoso. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there in manipulating voters. 
you will hear that undocumented migrants are voting. Not true. Kamala Harris was involved in a hit and run incident 10 years ago. Also not true. Women will have to register uh, with a new federal agency when they get pregnant. Not true. Uh, so, yeah, for every fact check we do, our, like we do our own research. We talk to experts on the issues. For example, when we fact check the fake uh, hit and run history, the story involving Kamala Harris, we talk to a doctor who traced the x-rays that supposedly show the victim's injuries to unrelated medical studies from the Netherlands. Um, but we also search online, online databases, official reports. We read transcripts of interviews and press conference. We look uh, for what other fact checkers have published previously. We ask authorities, public officials, organizations, companies to corroborate information. Y así por el estilo, um, we use six categories to rate the statements um, and, and, and the information we put to the test. As false, misleading, manipulated, lacks evidence, lacks context, and true, of course, for those statements that are accurate. Right? Todo lo que es verdad. And um, we have a, a WhatsApp channel. Uh, you know, we also have a WhatsApp channel where we can communicate directly with our audience, like this channel, which is actually a chatbot, allows users to send us questions about suspicious information circulating online. People can send us their messages via WhatsApp. Uh, to the number, let me see, 732-927-6246, right? Very useful. Thank you for that, Ronnie. What are some of the most common types of misinformation and disinformation that you encounter on your day-to-day? Well, I mean, much of what we see and fact-check every day are false and misleading claims by politicians related to issues like the economy, crime, and immigration. You know, this issue that immigration has become one of the most used to scare people to win votes, the rhetoric about migrants and crime, the use of false data to to um, to draw a link between immigration and drug trafficking across the border, for example. That's a problem that puts people at risk, like we all saw what happened to the immigrant community in Springfield, Ohio, just weeks ago. But I guess the main difference now, compared to the last election cycle, is the proliferation of AI deepfakes. You know, like the use of artificial intelligence to spread this information is perhaps, I would say, the biggest challenge we face as fact checkers right now. And that wasn't a thing in previous election campaigns. Like every day we find fake images of politicians in situations that are unreal, videos showing fake simulated humans telling false stories, voice generators, you know, like artificial intelligence software to copy someone's voice. Uh, so now you hear voices of politicians and celebrities saying things that they didn't actually say. I think we're crossing a very dangerous line here. You know, I wouldn't stop only at politics, you know, like artificial intelligence has led to to a tsunami of fake content of all kinds. Absolutely. And Ronnie, the real question here is, how can we spot the difference between an AI-generated piece of content and real content that we should be following? Well, I mean, it's becoming more and more difficult to tell what's real and and what's fake. And that's scary. That's so scary. Yeah, it is. (laughs) It is very much. I mean, as the technology improves, like pretty much anyone can create... uh, these high quality deep fakes with just with just a prompt, you know. And it's even more challenging when it comes to audio files. They don't show their you know, audio files, they don't show their imperfections as easily as images or videos. But there are some steps you can follow, I think. Uh and it, and it's all on the details, you know. Or AI software I think uh, still uh, struggles with details. That might change uh sometime soon. But for example, uh, some of these images look way too perfect, you know. Uh, they have this airbrush look. People's skin lacks texture or imperfections. It looks like the surfaces are covered with a thin layer of bar- varnish. And pay attention to the facial hair Well, when it comes to people, you know, does it look real? In the videos, look for lip synchronization. Do you notice a... a a slight delay between the movement of lips and the voice. The eyes of the people you see on the screen might also show like uh, these um, irregular blinking, you know. Um, 
Those are typical signs of a video generated by artificial intelligence. Well, we'll definitely be looking out for those details. Thank you so much for that uh, tip, Ronnie. And Edis, I want to pivot to you now. Let's talk about social media and our elections coverage there. You're the girl on the ground uh, covering everything that has to do with elections for our Noticias Telemundo social channels. You touched on this at the beginning, but I want to dive deeper. How do you manage to balance the need for timeliness with the need for accuracy in your coverage? Well, accuracy, accuracy will always come first. That's like a given. And don't get me wrong, we want to be uh, also the first one to get you the news. We want to you know, inform you timely, but never at the cost of accuracy. And we want you to have Noticias Telemundo in all the platforms on social media as the news that you can trust. This is uh, Las Cosas Como Son. En este año electoral escucharás muchas promesas y opiniones. Pero solo Noticias Telemundo te mostrará Las Cosas Como Son. And um, tying back to what Ronnie was saying about um, AI and, and information online that's fake, the source is really important. Whenever you see something and you don't know what that came from, or maybe you got it on through WhatsApp from a friend or a family member, you always look back to where it did this information actually originated. And we want to be that source. We want to be the source that like, okay, this is a Noticias Telemundo. Okay, then this is good. You know that it doesn't matter when it came from, if it has our logo, if it's created by us, it has like, uh, I would like to say, like a, a seal of <laughs> accuracy. <laughs> yes, that's, that's what it is. <laughs> and to your question of uh, being on the ground, this is something that probably Paula can even talk more about this than I can. <laughs> but this was a year that was, uh, it, it was a lot for us. I feel like in the last three months, we've lived like a year of, of coverage. And uh, we have the two conventions with, you know, big things happening. Um, the Republican convention was days after the assassination attempt on the ex-president Trump. And then for the Democratic, we had Kamala Harris instead of Joe Biden, who you know stepped down to the ticket also days before that. And it's been a lot to manage. And this is when our preparation is key. Because when you are, um, you know what to, what to do, you know your sources, you trust your facts, and you deliver it in a way that your audience can understand, this is a content that's always going to reach uh, the user. It's always going to reach the, the Latino community. And being out there is a big responsibility. We have over 11 million followers on our social channels. And we've been growing fast. We were just talking before, before we started recording about how insane that platform has become. And like half of the users, I saw, I saw this poll by Pew Research Center, that says that half of the users on TikTok are reporting to see news on their platform like they they get the news from TikTok which started a few years ago as this platform where you go see people do silly dances yeah. <laughs> now you have a lot of information that sometimes is accurate sometimes it's not and this is when the work of journalists is monumental we are the ones that have to uh, kind of set the line and say we are content creators as well but we have as Rene was saying this um arm of uh, of tools that we use to give you information in a timely and accurate manner. So it's a balance between the two things. And I think we can officially say politics has entered its influencer era. Oh, <laughs> I think we can all yeah. agree to that. It right is. Now. Yeah, it's, it's content creator. This is a new thing. We don't call it influencers anymore. It's like <laughs> this is something that we actually uh, I joke about it a lot with the team because we used to think about like influencers, quote unquote, like, oh, you know, yeah, this is people like whatever they have an opinion and they do this. But it has become a niche. You have people that create content from, I don't know, ants to garden to news to anything that you can imagine. So it's a lot of people that are creating this content and a lot more that are following them on social and you can see when we um, share something, for example, from the newscast on our social channels, that a lot of people will comment and even tag their friends. And then all the people will be like, oh, yeah, but it says like they have an opinion on it and they share it their way. We have uh, this call of like collages that they do with the news that we post because they want to comment on that. It's, it's, a, it's a growing trend. And I don't think that's going to stop. So for us, we have to be the content creators that you know, give you the news accurate and trustworthy. And that's, I think, is going to be the difference in general. 
Absolutely. Um, it's going to be interesting to your point to see how content creators become a part of this media ecosystem, especially when it comes to the younger voters. Uh, how are you seeing them changing the game in that regard, Iris? Oh, my God, totally, totally. Um, as an example, on the Democratic Convention, there were over 200 content creators that had passes to go on the floor and talk to politicians and interview things that usually were reserved for media. You know, the, the I don't want to say original media, but like the more the uh, conservative, outlets, maybe. right? Like the news uh, ne networks or, you know, the newspapers. And they are seeing that a lot of young people, especially a lot of Gen Z, are getting the news from social and are getting the news from these content creators that are on TikTok. And, you know, so you're popping the phones and being in the street and telling you, okay, this is what's happening, this, this, this. They don't longer follow the very set up style of news in which you have the anchors sitting at the desk and giving you the news. There's an audience for that still, absolutely. But there's also this um, feeling of you want to see what's behind the scenes. And this is the kind of content that also the reporters are creating uh, that... I, I feel that they're not waking up to this because it's been happening, but politicians aren't paying attention to this even more this year. They know that it's a big chunk of voters that are on social media that you have to be there to reach them. And Taylor Swift is a big example uh, when you see that she posts something and then you go back and look at the polls and see this many people register after that. That's a big influence. And it can go from that big name to a local person in California or Florida or Arizona that has this niche community and has a reach that might be, you know, potentially changing for a district on, a, on an election. And I feel that politicians are paying attention to that even more now. So you're going to see this growing. And I don't think that's stopping. If anything, it's going to become a part of what we do. And when we think of how to present the content to the audience. Absolutely. Well, we'll be seeing how that unravels this election and even in future elections. And uh, speaking of that influence, Paola, you've also taken to social media as a young journalist, in addition to your on-air contributions, of course. And I'm curious to know, how do these two reporting styles differ for you, if they do? And what's been a memorable moment uh, for you while covering the race to the White House for your 90,000 plus followers on Instagram? Um, well, look, I think I think Edith is absolutely right. Like, I think all of us have no option but to also be present on social media, right? I mean, I think maybe four years ago, the conversation would be different. We could sort of say the news behind desks. And, but I think if we understand our audience and the way that it's going and the way that young people are consuming information, you have to be on social media. You have to be on TikTok. You have to be on Instagram. And I will say, I think I was, I was reluctant at first even think of myself in TikTok. But I think to, <laughs> to Edith's point, um, honestly, it is, it's, it's wild for lack of a better word of like the way that that audience grows so fast. And also the way that you, you learn, I've learned so much just from TikTok, understanding the way that people are consuming news. And it's very simple, right? And I think it has to do in w with what all of us are saying, which is how do you cut through the myths and disinformation? How do you fact check? And so my approach on TikTok or on Instagram is, is simple and it's it's show people what you're seeing you know show people the ground take them on the journey with you because i think that sort of starts to to dispel a lot of this myth and disinformation right i think people are kind of yearning for the basics of like okay this is what's happening on the ground and i'm going to show you myself you no know? and this is what's happening at the border this is what's happening in communities and so that's that's sort of been my my approach in on social media like take people on the journey with you behind the stage and And whether that's been, you know, doing ride alongs with sheriffs in Arizona and sort of, you know, doing live streams from the back seat, you know, so people understand the story that way. And whether that was at the DNC, and I know Edis and her team did an incredible job sort of taking people backstage, but I think people love those little behind the scenes moments, you know, because it's, it's intimate. You feel like you're there, you feel like you're in the room. And more than anything, um, you have eyes on the news yourself, you know, not behind the desk. Um, not with anchors, um, not with sort of these graphs, but it, it is people's eyes are there with you. And I think that um, intimacy that's able to break screens is super important. Absolutely. Uh, and what would you say from your experience covering this election season was a moment that you felt 
really, really, I guess, either impacted you or or was memorable for you in your coverage so far? I mean, actually, I'll think of the last story um, we did. It's been a collaboration with with Telemundo, and, and Iris was involved in this and MSNBC, and it was being on the ground with uh, mixed status families in Arizona, specifically in Maricopa County, um, as they're really navigating um, what the realities of a potential Trump administration would be. And if he were to enact things like mass deportations as a family, how are mixed status families having those conversations of perhaps self-deporting themselves and leaving their U.S. born children in the U.S.? And so I think those difficult conversations that I think in, require, you know, spending enough time with these families to really get the audience to, to, to really sink into um, the emotion and the rawness and, and, and the sort of personal things that people are going through. So I think the, that, that last story a couple of weeks ago in Arizona really, really touched me. Yeah. Absolutely. Very powerful. Um, and I want to wrap with my last question for each of you, and it's a very important one. Uh, so before the big day comes, what is the most nerve wracking thing that keeps you up the night before? For me, it's, very, very easy, you know, la espera, waiting for election results, like from the first minute when the polling stations open until they close, like awaiting the results always makes me anxious, you know. Actually, I have to confess that anxiety begins to take hold of me the night before. Um, and this year, there would probably be more uncertainty, like right? given that it's uh, become increasingly likely that we'll go to sleep that night without knowing the winner. Uh, the race is just too close. So yeah, I mean, that's what keeps me out at night. Maybe it's just because the presidential campaign is so long, you know. Like we, uh, we've been hearing from the candidates every day for months or even years now. Like Donald Trump, he held his first rally of this cycle in June, 2021, just five months after leaving office. So, like when election day comes, it's like, for me, it's like watching the final episode of a TV series that has been on the air for four years. And we have no idea how it's going to end. You know, that's the worst thing. <laughs> but the outcome here will impact our lives. And that's very important, right? Yeah. And this election, particularly, this election day will be very special for me because it's my first time voting in the U.S. I became oh, an American congratulations, uh, Ronnie. Ago. That's amazing. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> So it's going to be even more, you know, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm going to be more anxious, you know, during, during the day. So, yeah, la espera, that's, that's just nerve wracking for me. <laughs> Absolutely. Hiciste una muy buena analogía. Creo que todos vamos a compartir ese sentimiento esa noche. <laughs> eh, <laughs> Iris, cuéntanos tú. Uh, I, I think that the night before I'm more uh, excited than actually nervous. It's been such a long uh, time coming. Uh, and I, as I was saying, for me, it's like the Olympics. Like, I feel like this race is like just on the start line. And you're just like, okay, just like ring the bell so I can run. Ring it, ring it. <laughs> I just wanted to start because it's been so much and you have so much. that You just want to get it going. So for me, it's just like... Uh, really finding the the peace, like the inner calm to be like, it's going to be a long day, it's going to be a lot, but it's here. And it's that excitement and knowing that the team is ready that just moves forward, whatever comes during the day. Awesome. Pao? I'll say it's a mix of emotions. I think I definitely feel the excitement. Um, it feels always so um, beautiful, no, to see, to see like, Here's a functioning democracy again, like the country's excited. Um, and that always feels like I, I always feel the weight of that. Um, so the night before you're kind of you kind of just like let go, you no, know, and everything you've been working towards and sort of all these assumptions and analysis that you put out there, it's like, all right, so let let's see how that plays out. So that's exciting. And then I have to say, um, I think the last this election I, I have a certain level of fear, you no, know, because when I think about sort of the facts that we've been talking about in the newsrooms and to our audience, you know, there's a there's a significant number of Americans um that still, you know, do not believe things like that Joe Biden is the legitimate president. You know? And so when when you think of how will how that will manifest in this next election, um, I, I worry about that. 
Right. Well, clearly a lot of nerve wracking things Mm -hmm. um, in our minds before Election Day. And I just want to say before we wrap, thank you all in advance for your service, for your commitment, uh, for putting yourselves in vulnerable situations sometimes in order to keep us informed as a community. I know it's not an easy job, but it's a much needed one. So thank you for that in advance. Um, y con eso, chicos, hemos llegado al momento del clacatazo. Are you ready for this part? <laughs> yes. So, el clacatazo, this is the fun part of the show. Um, this is where I'm going to ask each and every one of you a rapid fire question. And I want you to answer with the first thing that comes to mind. Cool? Okay. All right. No nerve wracking things here. Okay. <laughs> Paola, you're up first. Morning ritual on election day. Oh, me pongo música electrónica and I go on a run at like 5 a.m. And I've been doing that the last three election cycles. And I forget about everything for just 30 <laughs> minutes. And then that's it. For sure. Always. Y eso, mi gente, se llama quemar esos nervios. <laughs> <laughs> sí, exacto. Exacto. Ronnie, best trick to identify fake news? Who? Um, I mean, try to keep a critical mindset, I think. Read from different sources and question your belief before forming an opinion. That's for sure. And, you know, read beyond the headlines to better understand the story. And if you have doubts, ask someone, ask a friend, ask an expert, or consult um, a trusted fact-checking site. You know, that's basically it. And send a text to our WhatsApp channel for Te Verifica. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Ronnie will be there all night. <laughs> <laughs> I won't yeah. promise that. I don't know I'll that he wants to promote night, that, but... Yeah. but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Edie, take us home with this one. Guilty snack or beverage to keep you awake and alert through hours of election night. Oh my God, I, cafecito cubano for sure. <laughs> that's that's the one thing. Like, yeah, get my coffee. We do coladitas in the newsroom. It's it's like a ritual. So there are certain times of the day in which we go. Like, okay, it's coffee time, and we have a designated coffee maker that goes around <laughs> with cafecito cubano. And yeah, that's that's my my snack. I I need that. I can definitely attest to that. And just a quick note for all of our listeners who are not Miami natives out there. <laughs> a colada is a shot of very mm-hmm. potent Cuban mm-hmm. espresso with a lot of sugar that will give you energy you never knew you had. So you'll thank me for it later. <laughs> definitely something you should consider having on election night. Y bueno, Paola, Ronnie, Iris, muchas gracias. Thank you all so much for being with us here today and for taking us Inside the Newsroom on the Road to Decision 2024. Y para todos nuestros oyentes, déjenos saber en los comentarios su opinión sobre este episodio y no olviden suscribirse a nuestro canal de YouTube at Backstage con Telemundo y de seguirnos en Apple Podcasts y Spotify. Hasta la próxima. 